Even for Bel Air, the area of LA renowned for its extravagant properties, the house was extraordinary. Vast and sprawling, built entirely of white travertine marble, and accessible only by a private road, it occupied a 60-acre estate surrounded by a 12-foot wall topped by an electric fence. Dr. John D. had to wait for 10 minutes outside the closed gates while an armed security guard checked his identity and another guard examined every inch of the car, even scanned beneath it with a small camera. D. was glad he had chosen a commercial limousine service with a human driver. He wasn't sure what the guards would have made of a mud golem. D. had flown in from San Francisco late in the afternoon on his private jet. The limousine, booked by his office, had picked him up from Burbank, now renamed Bob Hope Airport, he noted, and driven him down to Sunset Boulevard through some of the most appalling traffic he had encountered since he had lived in Victorian London. For the first time in his very long life, Dee felt as if events were slipping out of his control. They were moving too quickly, and in his experience, that was when accidents happened. He was being rushed by people. Well, not people, exactly. More beings. Too eager for results. They had made him move against Flamel today, even though he had told them he needed another few days of preparation. And he had been right. 24 more hours of planning and surveillance would have enabled him to snatch Nicholas as well as Penele, and the entire Codex. D had warned his employers that Nicholas Flamel could be tricky indeed, but they hadn't listened to him. D knew Flamel better than anyone. Over the centuries, he had come close to catching him. Very close. But on every occasion, Flamel and Penele had managed to slip away. Sitting back in the air-conditioned car while the guards continued their inspections, he recalled the first time he had met the famous alchemist, Nicholas Flamel. John Dee was born in 1527. His was the world of Queen Elizabeth I, and he had served the queen in many capacities, as an advisor and a translator, a mathematician and an astronomer, and a personal astrologer. It had been left to him to choose the date of her coronation, and he picked noon on January 15th, 1559. He promised the young princess that hers would be a long reign, it lasted for 45 years. Dr. John Dee was also the Queen's spy. Dee spied for the English Queen across Europe and was her most influential and powerful agent operating on the continent. As a renowned scholar and scientist, magician and alchemist, he was welcomed at the courts of kings and the palaces of nobles. He professed to speak only English, Latin, and Greek, though in actuality he spoke a dozen languages well and understood at least a dozen more even Arabic, and a smattering of the language of Cathay. He learned early on that people were often indiscreet when they didn't know that he understood their every word, and he used that to his fullest advantage. Dee signed his confidential and coded reports with the numbers 007. He thought it wonderfully ironic that hundreds of years later, when Ian Fleming created James Bond, he gave Bond the same code name. John Dee was one of the most powerful magicians of his age. He had mastered necromancy and sorcery, astrology and mathematics, divination and scrying. His journeys across Europe brought him into contact with the, all the great magicians and sorcerers of that time, including the legendary Nicholas Flamel, the man known as the Alchemist. Dee discovered the existence of Nicholas Flamel, who had supposedly died in 1418 entirely by accident. That encounter was to shape the rest of his life, and in so many ways, influence the history of the world. Nicholas and Pernelle had returned to Paris in the first decade of the 16th century and were working as physicians, tending to the poor and sick in the very hospitals that Flamel's had founded more than a hundred years earlier. They were living and working virtually in the shadow of the great cathedral of Notre Dame. Dee was in Paris on a secret mission for the queen, but the moment he saw the slender, dark-haired man and his green-eyed wife working together in the high-ceiling wards of the hospital, he knew who they were. Dee was one of the few people in the world who had a copy of Flamel's masterwork, The Summary of Philosophy, which included an engraving of the famous alchemist opposite the title page. When Dee had introduced himself to the doctor and his wife, calling them by their true names, neither had denied it. Of course, they also knew of the famous Dr. John Dee by reputation. Although Pernelli had some reservations, Nicholas had been delighted with the opportunity to take on the English magician as a new apprentice. Dee had immediately left England and spent the next four years training with Nicholas and Pernelle in Paris. And it was in Paris, in the year 1575, that he had first learned of the existence of the Elder Race. 
He had been studying late at night in his tiny attic room in Flamel's house, when a creature out of a nightmare had slithered down the chimney, scattering coal and wood as it crawled out onto the scorched mat. The creature was a gargoyle, one of the ancient breed of ghouls that infested the sewers and graveyards of most European cities. Similar to the crude shapes carved in stone that decorated the cathedral almost directly opposite the house, this was a living creature of veined, marble-like flesh and cinder black eyes. Speaking in an archaic form of Greek, the gargoyle invited him to a meeting on the roof of the cathedral Notre Dame. Recognizing that this invitation was not one he could refuse, Dee followed the creature into the night. Loping along, sometimes on two legs, often on four, the gargoyle led him through increasingly narrow alleys, then down into the sewers, and eventually into a secret passageway that took him deep within the great cathedral walls. He followed the gargoyle up the thousand and one steps carved into the interior of the wall that finally led to the roof of the Gothic cathedral. Wait, it had commanded, and then said no more. Its mission accomplished, the gargoyle ignored D and settled down on the parapet, hunched forward, wings folded over its shoulders, tail curled tightly against its back, tiny horns visible as they jutted from its forehead. It peered over the square far below, tracking the movements of the late-night stragglers, or those who had no homes to go to, looking for a suitable meal. If anyone had chanced to glance up, the gargoyle would have been indistinguishable from any of the countless stone carvings on the building. D had walked to the edge of the roof and looked across the city. All of nighttime Paris was laid out below him, thousands of winking lights from cooking fires, oil lamps and candles, the smoke rising straight up into the still air, the countless dots of light split by the black curve of the Seine. From this height, D could hear the buzz of the city, a low drone, like a beehive settling down for the night, and the smell of noxious stench that hung over the streets a combination of sewers, rotting fruit and spoiled meat, human and animal sweat, and the stink of the river itself. Perched over the cathedral's famous rose window, D waited. The study of magic had taught him many things, especially the value of patience. The scholar in him enjoyed the experience of standing on the roof of the tallest building in Paris, and he wished he had brought his sketch pad with him. He contented himself with looking around, committing everything he saw to his incredible memory. He recalled a recent visit to Florence. He had gone there to examine the diaries of Leonardo da Vinci. They were written in a strange cipher which no one would have been able to break. It took him less than an hour to crack the code. No one had realized that Leonardo had written his diaries not only in code, but in mirror image. The diaries were full of many amazing drawings for proposed inventions. Guns that fired many times. An armored coach that moved without the need of horses. And a craft that could sail beneath the sea. There was one, however, that particularly interested D, a harness that da Vinci claimed would allow a man to take to the air and fly like a bird. D had not been entirely convinced that the design would work, though he wanted nothing more in the world than to fly. Looking out over Paris now, he began to imagine what it would be like to strap da Vinci's wings to his arms and sail out over the roofs. His thoughts were interrupted as a flicker of movement caught his attention. He turned to the north, where a shape was moving in the night sky, a black shadow trailing scores of smaller dots. The smaller shapes looked as if they could be birds, except that he knew that birds rarely fly at night. Dean knew immediately and without question that this was what he had been brought up here to meet. He concentrated on the larger shape as it came closer, trying to make sense of what he was seeing, but it was only when the figure dropped onto the roof that he realized he was looking at an ashen-faced woman dressed entirely in black, wearing a long cloak of crow's wings. That night, Dr. John D. first met the Morrigan. That night, he learned of the Elder Race and how they had been forced from the world of men by the magic in the book of Abraham the Mage, a book that was currently in the possession of Nicholas Flamel. That night, D. learned that there were those among the elders who wanted to return to their rightful place as the rulers of mankind. And that night, the crow goddess promised Dee that he would one day control the entire world. He would be master of an empire that stretched from pole to pole, from sunrise to sunset. All he had to do was steal the book from Fomel and hand it over. That night, Dr. John D. became the champion of the Dark Elders. It was a mission that had taken him across the world and into the many shadow realms that bordered it. He had fought ghosts and ghouls, creatures that had no right to exist outside of nightmares, 
others that were left over from a time predating the arrival of the human eye. He had gone to battle at the head of an army of monsters, and had spent at least a decade wandering lost in an icy other world. Many times he had been concerned for his safety, but he had never been truly frightened. Until this moment, sitting before the entrance to a Bel Air estate in 21st century Los Angeles. In those early days, he had not been fully aware of the powers of the creatures he served, but nearly four and a half centuries in their service has taught him many things, including the fact that death was probably the least of all the punishments they could inflict on him. The armed security guard stepped back, and the high metal gates clicked open, allowing Dee's car to sweep in on a long white stone driveway toward the sprawling marble mansion that was just visible through the trees. Although night had fallen, no lights were showing in the house, and for a moment, Dee imagined that no one was home. Then he remembered that the person, the creature he had come to meet, preferred the hours of darkness and had no need of lights. The car turned into the circular drive in front of the main entrance, where the headlights picked up a trio of people standing on the bottom step. When the car finally crunched to a halt on the white gravel, a figure stepped up to the door and pulled it open. It was impossible to make out any details in the gloom, but the voice that came out of the darkness was male and spoke to him in heavily accented English. Dr. D, I presume. I am Suhanit. Please come in. We've been expecting you. Then the figure turned away and strode up the steps. D climbed out of the car, brushed off his expensive suit, and, conscious that his heart was fluttering, followed Sehunet into the mansion. The other two figures fell into step on either side of him. Although no one said anything, D knew they were guards, and he wasn't entirely sure they were human. The magician recognized the heavy, cloying scent as soon as he stepped into the house. It was frankincense the rare and incredibly expensive aromic gum from the Middle East, used in ancient times in Egypt and Greece, and as far to the east as China. Dee felt his eyes water and his nose twitch. Those of the elder race were particularly fond of frankincense, but it gave him a headache. As the three shadowy figures led Dee into the great hallway, he caught a glimpse of Sehunet, a small, slender man, bald and olive-skinned. He looked as if he was of Middle Eastern origin, from Egypt or Yemen, Sehunet pushed close the heavy front door, spoke two words, Stay here, and then disappeared into the darkness, leaving D in the company of the two silent guards. D looked around. Even in the shadowy half-life, he could see that the hallway was bare. There was no furniture on the tiled floor. There were no pictures or mirrors on the walls, no curtains on the windows. He knew that there were houses like these scattered across the world, homes to those few dark elders who liked to walk in the world of men usually creating mischief. Though they were extraordinarily skilled and dangerous, their powers were extremely limited because of the proliferation of iron in the modern world, which dulled their magical energies. In the way that lead was poisonous to humans, iron, the metal of mankind, was deadly to the elder race. Dee knew, even without looking, that there would not be a scrap of that particular metal in this house. Everything would be made of gold or silver, even down to the door handles and the taps in the bathrooms. The Dark Elders valued their privacy. Their preference was for quiet, out-of-the-way places. Small islands, patches of desert, countries like Switzerland, portions of the former Soviet Union, the Arctic reaches of Canada, Himalayan temples, and the Brazilian jungle. When they chose to live in cities like this one, their houses were secured behind walls and wire, the guards patrolled by armed guards and dogs. And if anyone was lucky, or foolish enough to actually reach the house, they would encounter older, darker, and more lethal guards. This way. D was pleased that he had managed to control his fright at the sound of Sehunet's voice. He hadn't heard the man return. Would they go up or down, he wondered. In his experience, those of the elder race fell into two neat categories. Those who preferred to sleep on roofs, and those who preferred basements. The Morrigan was a creature of attics and roofs. Sehunet stepped into a puddle of light, and D noticed now that his eyes were painted with black coal, the top lid completely blackened, two horizontal lines running from the corners of his eyes to his ears. Three vertical white lines were painted on his chin, beneath his lips. He led D to a concealed door directly under the broad staircase, and opened it with a password in the language that the boy king Tutankhamen would have spoken. D followed the figure into a pitch black corridor, and stopped when the door clicked shut behind them. He heard the man moving ahead of him, 
than his footsteps clicking on the stairs. Down. D should have guessed that the dark elder the Morgan had sent him to see would be a creature of basements and tunnels. I'll need light, he said aloud. I don't want to fall down the stairs in the dark and break my neck. His voice echoed slightly in the confined space. There is no electricity in this house, Dr. John D. But we have heard that you are a magician of note. If you wish to create light, then you are permitted to do so. Without a word, D stretched out his hand. A blue spark snapped to life in his palm. It buzzed and hissed, spinning about. Then it started to grow, from the size of a pea to that of a grape. It gave off a cool blue-white light. Holding his hand out in front of him, D started down the stairs. He began to count the steps as he descended, but quickly gave up, distracted by the decorations on the walls, the ceiling, and even the floor. It was like stepping into an Egyptian tomb, but unlike any of the countless tombs he had seen, where the artwork was faded, chipped, and broken, and everything was coated in a fine layer of gritty sand, here the decorations were pristine, brilliant, and complete. The colors, slightly distorted by the blue light he was carrying, looked as if they had just been laid down. The pictographs and hieroglyphs were vivid and crisp, the names of gods picked out in thick gold leaf. A sudden updraft caused the blue-white ball of light to flicker and dance in his hand, sending the shadows leaping and darting. Dee's nostrils flared. The wind carried the stench of something old, old and long dead. The stairs ended in a wide, vaulted cellar. Dee felt something crunch and snap beneath his feet with his first step. He lowered his hand and the blue-white light shone across the floor, which was covered with countless tiny white bones, blanketed the ground in an ivory carpet. It took Dee a long moment before he realized the bones as those of rats and mice. Some of them were so old that they crumbled into white powder when he disturbed them, but others were much newer. Unwilling to ask a question to which he really did not want an answer, Dee followed his silent guide, bones crunching and crackling with every step. He lifted his hand high, shedding light across the chamber. Unlike the stairwell, however, this room was unadorned. The walls streaked black with moisture, green mold gathering close to the floor, sprouting fungi dappling the ceiling. It looks like you have a problem with damp, Dee said unnecessarily, simply to break the growing silence. It is no, no matter, Sirinette said quietly. Have you been here long? Dee wondered, glancing around. In this place? The other man paused, considering. Less than a hundred years. No time at all, really. A shape moved in the shadows. And we will not be here much longer. That is why you are here, isn't it, Dr. D? The voice was a cross between a sultry growl and a purr, shaping the English words with difficulty. Almost against his will, D raised his hand, allowing the light in his palm to illuminate the tall, slender figure that moved in the gloom. The light moved over bare feet, toenails black and pointed like claws, then up a heavy, white, kilt-like skirt studded with stones and precious jewels, and a chest crisscrossed with wide straps etched with Egyptian characters, and finally reached the head. Although he knew what he was going to see, Dee couldn't prevent the gasp of shock from escaping his lips as he looked at Bastet. The body was that of a woman, but the head that brushed the arched ceiling belonged to a cat, sleek and furred, with huge yellow slit pupiled eyes, a long pointed snout and high triangular ears. The mouth opened and Dee's cold light ran across gleaming yellow teeth. This was the creature that had been worshipped for generations throughout the land of Egypt. D licked dry lips as he bowed deeply. Your niece, the Morrigan, sends her regards and has asked me to relay the message as it's time to take your revenge on the three-faced one. Bastet surged forward and wrapped razor-tipped claws in the folds of D's expensive suit coat, puncturing holes in the silk. Precisely. Tell me precisely what my niece said, she demanded. I have told you. Dee said, looking up into the terrifying face. Bastet's breath smelled of rotten meat. He tossed the blue-white ball of light into the air, where it hung, suspended and whirling. Then he cra carefully removed Bastet's claws from his jacket. The coat was a shredded ruin. The Morrigan wants you to join her in the attack on Hecate's Shadow Realm, Dee said simply. Then it is time, Bastet announced triumphantly. <laughs>
The ancient magician nodded, shadows racing and dancing along the walls with the movement. It is time, he agreed. Time for the Elder Race to return and reclaim this earth. Bastet howled, the sound high-pitched and terrifying. And then the darkness behind her boiled and shifted as thousands of cats of every breed, of all shapes and sizes, poured into the cellar and gathered around her in an ever-widening circle. It is time to hunt, she announced. Time to feed. The cats threw back their heads and mewled and howled. Dee found the din utterly terrifying. It sounded like countless lost babies crying. 